welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land to talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. And thank you listeners for bearing with our abnormal release schedule um, that facilitated a vacation for David and me to Switzerland that we've been looking forward to for seven years. (laughs) (laughs) So we finally got to go. Thank you for... Uh, being patient with us. We've taken a little recording hiatus, so we're coming back coming back strong with the pre-Socratics, yeah. um, to be specific, Heraclitus and Parmenides, who you may have heard of. Heraclitus would be famous for the uh, You Can't Step in the Same River Twice, Ooh. which was uh, co-opted by Disney's Pocahontas, which is still one of the best illustrations of the platonic uh, <laughs> freedom nature dialectic, not freedom nature, chaos order dialectic. Hmm that has ever been illustrated wow (laughs) (laughs) illustrated for for children children, i would not let my daughter watch pocahontas (laughs) until she's a fair bit older (laughs) i don't recommend it (laughs) it has yeah it has very catchy music that is unfortunately very um i mean it's it's not the worst thing i've ever seen and i don't think it's like going to poison any child's mind it's just once you once you've like read a little bit of Plato, it's like oh, see what you're doing here. <laughs> yep. Okay, that was neat. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Moving and on. speaking of moving on, <laughs> <laughs> please let's move on from Pocahontas. <laughs> we have been looking at the pre-Socratics, who were by and large uh, Milesian, Ionian. That is, they came from what we call Asia Minor or Turkey today. Um. These were gentlemen, gentlemen in the sense that they didn't have to work a whole lot. They could sit around and think stuff and write stuff and go exploring and wondering. And when they were all done, they came back with these profound statements. Thales said, all is water. Anaximenes said, all is air. Uh, Anaximander said, all is, and he uses the word uh, aperon, which means boundless, infinite, unlimited, uh, yeah, whatever that those undefined <laughs> terms mean. And then in Heraclitus, who says all is fire. As we saw last time, uh, a number of modern historians, having praised these gentlemen to the skies, then turn around and point out some things that are fairly obvious, like none of this is science. This is, you, there's no way that empirical investigation gets you to all is anything since you have <laughs> not don't been act the same as the others <laughs> yeah and you haven't been everywhere you in fact hardly been past egypt if or babylon if you're lucky so you're and the question you, you ask a lot of questions but you don't pursue it in anything that we today would consider a scientific manner and most of your conclusions guys was they were wrong <laughs> and in terms of practical stuff you handed down to us, well, first of all, a lot of your uh, empirical observations you, you kind of borrowed from the uh, Chaldeans and the Egyptians, which in Ka- Thales' case allowed him to cash in on um, some grain sales because he could predict um, certain uh, astronomical oh, yeah. things that were happening. <laughs> None of this got passed on in any useful form to anybody. So in terms of giving us something simple like a steel plow or a windmill or electricity, these guys failed across the board. <laughs> they they just Is that the didn't. measure of success? Well, if that's what you're looking for, they <laughs> they did not produce technology. They were guessing wildly without any kind of empirical evidence to back up their guesses. And the thing that, that really these, these historians uh, value them for was that they turned to reason, except that the modern historians are thinking post-enlightenment, uh, man's reason as some kind of autonomous mathematical machine computer that analyzes data in a neutral fashion and spits out uh, analysis. The pre-Socratics still lived in a religious world, consciously, mm-hmm. self-consciously religious, where reason was simply one aspect of divinity. 
And mm-hmm. to follow your reason was to enjoy, in very simple words, being God. Uh, and so these these men didn't, they dismissed Homer and Hesiod's Olympian deities as not worthy of being worshipped. But they didn't eliminate the idea of multiple gods. We're going to talk briefly about Xenophon. The closest that uh, the Ionians ever came to monotheism, monotheism, he talked about a great god, the greatest god, an infinitely powerful god, uh, who can move the the world by his own thoughts. And so he is unmovable himself, doesn't need to move because, wow, he can, what Zeus could do with a nod of the head, he does just by thinking. Uh, and he's infinitely good, apparently. The problem with Xenophon's god is he's located someplace. He's, he's not omnipresent. He's not imminent in the sense of being everywhere. He's imminent in the place that he, he lives someplace. Apparently, around the world, if, literally. Uh, imagine <laughs> going a, out- In a sphere. <laughs> in a sphere, yeah. Imagine going out from the earth in all directions and you would run into this god. And he just stays there and governs things. And his existence, though, does not mean that there are not other lesser deities or other deities of some sort. So Xenophon does not try to eliminate other deities. He just has one really great god who's much greater than anything Homer ever had and a lot more moral. But then what exactly? How does he exercise this morality? Yeah, it's it's kind of vague. And and again, we're dealing largely with fragments. We have a little bit mm-hmm. from Xenophon. One of the... the the last um, lines in his fragments amounts to, yeah, and all the stuff I've talked about is so far beyond us, and this God is so far beyond us that I don't even know whether or not we're right or can understand anything. Okay, well. All right, then. <laughs> there you What was the purpose of reading yeah, all the stuff that really you wrote? No. Well, that's the funny thing. You know, so many ancient books, so many ancient resources. There's just not a lot to work with no. once you get down to the actual manuscripts. If there are <laughs> manuscripts, they might just be scraps. Yeah. Uh, most of what we have for the pre-Socratics are, in fact, that, or more often, they are quotes by people who mm-hmm. live two or three or four generations later. They are quotes by Aristotle or by someone who's analyzing Aristotle yet more generations later. And judging the scraps that we do have against what Aristotle says, you know, I'll be sure that Aristotle was paying attention. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yet... Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land to talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. And thank you, listeners, for bearing with our abnormal release schedule um, that facilitated a vacation for David and me to Switzerland that we've been looking forward to for seven years. (laughs) (laughs) So we finally got to go. Thank you for uh, being patient with us. We've taken a little recording hiatus. So we're coming back, coming back strong with the pre-Socratics. Yeah. Um, to be specific, Heraclitus and Parmenides, who you may have heard of. Heraclitus would be famous for the uh, You Can't Step in the Same River Twice, Ooh. which was uh, co-opted by Disney's Pocahontas, which is still one of the best illustrations of the platonic uh, <laughs> freedom nature dialectic, not freedom nature, chaos order dialectic mm. that has ever been illustrated. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Illustrated, illustrated for, for children. children I would LS. not let my daughter watch Pocahontas until <laughs> she's I've a fair bit older. <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> it has, yeah, it has very catchy music that is unfortunately very. Um, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's not the worst thing I've ever children. seen, and I don't think it's like going to poison any child's mind. It's just once you once you've like read a little bit of Plato, it's like, oh, see what you're doing here. Yep. Okay. <laughs> That was neat. <laughs> moving on. Moving and on. speaking of moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Please, let's move on from Pocahontas. <laughs> we have been looking at the pre-Socratics who were by and large uh, Milesian, Ionian. That is, they came from what we call Asia Minor or Turkey today. 
um, these were gentlemen, gentlemen in the sense that they didn't have to work a whole lot. They could sit around and think stuff and write stuff and go exploring and wondering. And when they were all done, they came back with these profound statements. Thales said, all is water. Anaximenes said, all is air. Uh, Anaximander said, all is, and he uses the word uh, aparon, which means boundless, infinite, unlimited. Uh, yeah, whatever that those undefined <laughs> terms mean. And then Heraclitus, who says, all is fire. As we saw last time, uh, a number of modern historians, having praised these gentlemen to the skies, then turn around and point out some things that are fairly obvious, like none of this is science. This is, you, there's no way that empirical investigation gets you to all is anything since you have <laughs> not don't been. don't act the same as the others. <laughs> yeah. And you haven't been everywhere. You, in fact, hardly been past Egypt if, or Babylon if you're lucky. So you're, and the question, you, you ask a lot of questions, but you don't pursue it in anything that we today would consider a scientific manner. And most of your conclusions, guys, was they were wrong. <laughs> and in terms of practical stuff you handed down to us, well, first of all, a lot of your uh, empirical observations, you, you kind of borrowed from the uh, Chaldeans and the Egyptians, which in Ka Thales' case allowed him to cash in on um, some grain sales because he could predict um, certain uh, astronomical oh, yeah. things that were happening. <laughs> None of this got passed on in any useful form to anybody. So in terms of giving us something simple like a steel plow or a windmill or electricity, these guys failed across the board. <laughs> they, they just- Is that the did, measure of success? Well, if that's what you're looking for, <laughs> they did not produce technology. They were guessing wildly without any kind of empirical evidence to back up their guesses. And the thing that, that really these, these historians uh, value them for was that they turned to reason, except that the modern historians are thinking post-enlightenment, uh, man's reason as some kind of autonomous mathematical machine computer that analyzes data in a neutral fashion and spits out uh, analysis. The pre-Socratics still lived in a religious world, consciously, mm -hmm. self-consciously religious, where reason was simply one aspect of divinity. And mm -hmm. to follow your reason was to enjoy, in very simple words, being God. Uh, and so these, these men didn't, they dismissed Homer and Hesiod's Olympian deities as not worthy of being worshipped, but they didn't eliminate the idea of multiple gods. We're going to talk briefly about Xenophon, the closest that uh, the Ionians ever came to monotheism, monotheism. He talked about a great god, the greatest god, an infinitely powerful god, uh, who can move the, the world by his own thoughts. And so he is unmovable himself, doesn't need to move because, wow, he can, what Zeus could do with a nod of the head, he does just by thinking. Uh, and he's infinitely good, apparently. The problem with Xenophon's God is he's located someplace. He's, he's not omnipresent. He's not imminent in the sense of being everywhere. He's imminent in the place that he, he lives someplace. Apparently around the world, if, literally. Uh, imagine <laughs> going a, out- In a sphere. <laughs> in a sphere, yeah. Imagine going out from the earth in all directions and you would run into this god. And he just stays there and governs things. And his existence, though, does not mean that there are not other lesser deities or other deities of some sort. So Xenophon does not try to eliminate other deities. He just has one really great god who's much greater than anything Homer ever had and a lot more moral. But then what exactly? How does he exercise this morality? Yeah, it's it's kind of vague. And and again, we're dealing largely with fragments. We have a little bit mm -hmm. from Xenophon. One of the, the last um, lines in his fragments amounts to, 
Yeah, and all the stuff I've talked about is so far beyond us, and this God is so far beyond us that I don't even know whether or not we're right or can understand anything. Okay, well. All right, then. <laughs> there you what was the purpose of reading yeah, all the stuff that you really wrote? No. Well, that's the funny thing. You know, so many ancient books, so many ancient resources. There's just not a lot to work with. No. Once you get down to the actual manuscripts, if there are <laughs> manuscripts, they might just be scraps. Yeah. Uh, most of what we have for the pre-Socratics are, in fact, that, or more often, they are quotes by people who mm -hmm. live two or three or four generations later. They are quotes by Aristotle or by someone who's analyzing Aristotle yet more generations later. And judging the scraps that we do have against what Aristotle says, you're not always sure that Aristotle was paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, for a few centuries now, uh, the historians have been telling us these were the guys. They got it. This is the beginning of modern science. This is the beginning of rationalism, of naturalism. Now, the naturalism. See, when <laughs> anyone after the Enlightenment, or at least after the death of Romanticism, if it ever died, says naturalism, um, we're thinking of atoms in motion. Mm -hmm. When they said, if they can say naturalism or, or have a concept similar, they would mean the divine essence that fills the universe. Those yeah, are not it's closer the to animism. Than yeah. empiricism. Yeah. Or pantheism. It's pantheism. it's not the same thing at all. And to try to read our worldview into theirs is silly mm -hmm. and not worthy of scholars, except that these modern scholars really are blinded. They have been fed the same lies that they now promulgate. I, I don't know that they do so deliberately, but these scholars are supposed to be intelligent. They should be able to, to spot a presupposition when they see one and say, wait, that's we're making some huge assumptions about how they thought and what they meant. Why don't we go back and see from their point of view what they actually meant? Uh, but very few, very few have done that. I think some of the more recent writers are kind of leaning that way of actually letting the texts speak more for themselves. Of I mean, course, part of the problem is the writers of history books are not necessarily specialists in no. any particular area, let alone yeah. this one. Yeah, this, so they're the, they're repeating what they've been told. Yeah, this is most certainly true. Well, this brings us to the two men you mentioned earlier, Heraclitus and Parmenides. We have a few more scraps and and um, poems from them. Uh, with Heraclitus, it's mostly proverbs and obscure sayings. Uh, what was the one one of you ladies mentioned? Can't oh. step in the same river twice. Yeah, I can't step same in the same river twice. twice. Everything always changes. Uh, all is flux, all is change. And in order to prove this, he simply pointed to the world around him. Look, the river that's here today is not the river that was here yesterday. The waters keep passing by, new waters come, and the very shape and course of the river over time changes. It can shift its banks. Uh, and you can point at any phenomena in, in the natural order, and it's not what it was. To him, this was self self evident proof. Now, behind, leaving that empirical observation, he then proceeds to go beyond empirical observation into pure speculation, and says that all is fire, sentient fire, living fire, being kindled, unkindled, going in and out, and it uh, the sentience he gave the word logos to. Now we know logos from the New Testament. And that has led some liberal theologians to say, see, John was just checking out the Logos theology, uh, theology that began with Heraclitus and moves on through the Stoics and such. Uh, nothing new here. It's just uh, John uh, <laughs> harping on thinly veiled Greek philosophy. Except that he changes the definition of the <laughs> yeah. word by yeah. using Com it. <laughs> completely changing it, completely redefining it. Just just enough of a, a nod that there is a reason he uses logos, which means mm -hmm. a word, uh, an ordering principle, wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, would be the Hebrew And equivalent. he certainly would have known about the Stoics and their philosophy. It's, yeah. He's not speaking into a vacuum. He's aware. <laughs> yeah. So this this is what we have with, with, with Heraclitus. Uh, the, the closest, um, he said living fire, probably the closest thing that um, 
our generation or the ones just after us would have would be the Force in Star mm -hmm. Wars. Mm -hmm. It's an energy field generated by all living creatures. <laughs> it both controls and can be controlled. Uh, you know that it's that's all it is. It's 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 it. it he said fire because that's the word he had. We would say energy that is governed by some kind of logical, rational principle or structure or something uh, that shapes reality. And our all we can do is try to conform to it, and maybe therein lies some kind of happiness. He didn't offer a whole lot more than that. Uh, he's been used by uh, Dr. Cornelius Van Til as the the premier example of someone who favors the many, the particulars, uh, chaos, uh, diversity, change, over against unity, order, oneness. For that, we now turn to Parmenides. Parmenides. This is Parmenides. easy to remember because his name sounds more like permanent. Oh, there you go. Uh, he said that all is one. One what? It doesn't exactly just, say. Just one. Just one. It, it, <laughs> It, all reality is real. Now, I, I love his argument because you, as you listen to it, you you, you stop and say, "Wait, what?" Because <laughs> it almost makes sense. Yeah. Except, yeah. <laughs> his first his first line is this: "What is is." We can agree about that. <laughs> what isn't isn't. Or to we put can it also differently, agree about that. <laughs> be careful. Watch for the trap. <laughs> <laughs> being exists, non-being does not exist. There's no such thing as non-being. By definition, it doesn't, it's that which isn't there. So there is no place where you will encounter non-being. You will not walk into a room and say, wow, there is literally nothing here because nothing it doesn't exist. It's there's there's something there. Air, space, whatever you want to call it. There's something in this room. So there's never, strictly speaking, any kind of emptiness, any kind of void. To put it in different language, well, a language more familiar to the Greek philosophers, the void does not exist. Uh, even as late as one of the textbooks we use in our school, um, I think it's called Matter in Motion, it speaks of mat matter in the void, atoms moving through space. Uh, what, pa what Parmenides is saying is there's no space. Space. There's no <laughs> void. There's no emptiness. There is wherever there is something. There is something, not nothing. Now here it gets here it gets cute. Because of this, there are no empty spaces into which anything can move, <laughs> which means nothing moves. Just forget what your eyes tell you. Nothing moves, because all change depends upon motion. Nothing changes. Again, your senses may tell you otherwise. Your senses are lying to you. That's all illusion. Matter, reality, being, is, and that's it. Uh, it can't be divided from itself by non-being, because non-being doesn't exist. You can't divide being with being, because that would be more being. Um, now, he doesn't, as far as I can tell, he doesn't talk about the nature of being, that is, does it come in different flavors and colors and and shapes and textures, or as we would say, elements on the periodic table. But it doesn't matter a whole lot because we're back to, and there is no emptiness between it that counts for anything. So it's still stuck, and it still doesn't move, and things still don't change. And thus all is one. Total oneness, unity, the universal. The universal is concrete. It's the universe. And the universe is just stuck in mud, as it were, and not going anywhere. And in order, but in order to believe this, we have to get rid of all of our preconceptions about how our senses work, and get rid of um, any trust in empirical evidence or central evidence. Now, I was I assumed that Parmenides would look both ways before he crossed the street to yeah. avoid being hit by a <laughs> chariot or something <laughs> akin to it moving at high speeds, despite his assertion that things don't move. Well, you know, this seems to be pretty um, typical of all philosophers, that they assert something with great vehemence and nonetheless practically in their day-to-day -day lives, like 
yeah, crossing the street. Don't pay attention to it a whole lot. Suddenly they are concerned. And I, I, I would guess that Parmenides did look both ways before crossing the street. Whether he justified that is his, I, I, the illusion is great. Uh, but then me turning my head is also part of the illusion. So <laughs> no big deal there. It's all illusory. What do Hindus do with that when they see a car bearing down on them? Do they look both ways? Do they get out of the way or do they just stand there and say, it is real. I and the car are one. Well, you're about to be. <laughs> no. no. Uh, and, and so one other thing, um, if you study calculus or pre-calculus, you're going to run into one of Parmenides' disciples, a man named Zeno. He has another great way of showing that change and motion are illusory. It's called the story, and I hope I get this right. Someone will tell me if I don't. It's Achilles and I believe it's the hare. I might be I the thought tortoise. it was the tortoise. Maybe it's the I tortoise. I think I always well, heard the tortoise. All right, we'll go with the tortoise. I can never, <laughs> I always get confused. I forgot to look. Um, the, and it amounts to this. The, these two are going to have a race. Of course, Achilles is the fleet-footed hero of, of the Iliad. And a tortoise is slow. so But we're going to give the tortoise a head start, and that's crucial here. The tortoise is going to start out, and after he's gotten far enough, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. Uh, Achilles will go after him. and But here's the thing. As Achilles reaches where the tortoise was, the tortoise has moved on. And as Achilles continues, and he gets to the next place where the tortoise was, the tortoise has moved on. And this continues indefinitely. Achilles can never catch up with the tortoise because whenever he gets to where the tortoise was, the tortoise has moved on. Now, we look at this and say, but that's ridiculous. And he says, exactly. Your senses tell you so. Therefore, obviously, the problem, since it can't be with my rational argument, must <laughs> be with your eyes. You're imagining things and you've convinced yourself they're real, when in fact, trusting your eyes leads to contradictions. Achilles can never catch the tortoise. Now, in the reason it shows up in pre-calculus and calculus is this is a limit problem. Mm -hmm. As you get, as Achilles gets closer and closer, uh, the the amount of distance he is traveling becomes smaller and smaller until it becomes uh, infinitesimally small. So, uh, compare the problem of um, the frog jumping halfway to the pond, mm -hmm. and then halfway again, then halfway again, then halfway again. Mm -hmm. and there comes a point where that next halfway, he's going to fall in the pond because he's larger than infinitesimally small. And he will, in fact, cross that limit. And there's a question of time. It may, if you give the the tortoise a long enough lead, it may take Achilles quite a while to catch him the first to catch up to the, where he was the first time. Less the second time, less still, and eventually it's going to be microseconds and nanoseconds that we're talking. Time is vanishingly slow. Distance is vanishingly slow. And if you've done pre-calculus or calculus, you know about limits, and you know there comes a point where we can, we pass a limit, and reality picks up again, and the clock starts ticking. <laughs> but mathematically, until Newton came along, um, about 1,200 years later, there was no mathematical or scientific response to Zeno's paradox. People just said pretty much what the average teenager would say, that's stupid, and then went on with it. <laughs> but it took a because while. Because such was sufficiently <laughs> obvious. Because it was sufficiently obvious. Are you going to trust your... Your... Um, your lion eyes? Hmm. Yeah, or not. <laughs> so this is all background for the three great Greek philosophers, Socrates, uh, Plato, and Aristotle. Uh, le let's set the ground a little bit for Socrates without fully getting into uh, his campaign, if you can call it that, his, his attack on Athens, because <laughs> that's, how the, that's how people saw it. Uh, Athens was becoming a democracy. 
And that meant, and, and we, we hear a lot about Athenian liberty, Greek liberty, and democracy, and all that. That was for a generation or so. But it was at a very key time because this, this democracy amounted to the, the rule of citizens who were about 30% of the population, male, property owners over whatever the age of majority was for Athens. In other words, it did not include most people. It certainly did not include women. A good amount of the people living in Athens were slaves, so much for Athenian liberty. Um, women mostly stayed at home and stayed out of the way. Uh, the older writer, the older historians basically look at the Greeks as treating their women as slaves. Modern writers are kind of rewriting that, thinking that maybe women have always been women and wouldn't put up with that very much. <laughs> <clears throat> but certainly they didn't hold uh, political office of any sort. And this meant that uh, when you got together, true democracy, and this is something that Americans don't understand, true democracy means you're all in the same room and you're all voting in person. And 50% plus one carries the day. Under such circumstances, it becomes very important to win arguments because what the assembly decides that day may affect your business interests, your, your fortune, your future, all kinds of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so you got to win the argument. The issue here is not to present a logical argument, except when logic happens to be a good way of winning this particular argument. You want to win. You want to, and if that means cheating, using all kinds of fallacies that first-year logic students could spot, whatever, you win the argument. You learn both logic and rhetoric as means of um, convincing people to see it your way. And this was not something that dad usually could teach his son. You needed specialized teachers for this. And it's at this point that along come a bunch of wise guys. The sophists. The sophists. Sophists means those who pursue wisdom. Sophia is the name of the goddess of wisdom. Um, and But, you know, the word sophistry has taken on different connotations today. It means word trickery. And, and this is in part due to, to Socrates, because he encountered these guys and called them on the carpet anytime they... They went for this, or at least so Plato says in his various <laughs> dialogues. Um, so we have these men offering their services. They were itinerant teachers, um, and they would take on disciples, and they would teach them the fine arts of um, rhetorical combat so they could win arguments so that their families and their family businesses could get ahead. There can't be any problem with this. We do it all the time in America, don't we? Yeah, well, anyway, it's into this that um, Socrates stumbles. And I'm trying really hard not to take us there since we really didn't prep for Socrates. <laughs> There's a lot to say about Socrates, so we're saving that for next time. Yeah, we'll save that for next time. But I will ask you ladies this. Do you remember the TV uh, detective Columbo? Yes. Yes. Oh. No, I never saw any of it. Ah, <laughs> you must. I've heard you talk about it. <laughs> mm. Okay. My, my parents enjoyed it. Okay. We Rachel, watched. really, try uh, call one up. Probably not the first one, because the first one, they were still fighting their feet. But after that, <laughs> um, he wears uh, a raincoat, because you never know. Well, you, you have know, to say the LA. most important thing about him, which is mm -hmm. that he is the grandfather from The Princess Bride. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. There you go. Was it before or after Princess Bride? Oh, before. before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Peter Falk. So the, the character, the grandfather, actually it, it it does, does things so. <laughs> that are alluding to Columbo. Like the, oh, interesting. the padding, okay. the padding his pockets as oh, he's about to leave. Thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he presents him, Columbo presents himself. We never know for sure what his first name is. He has a wife whose name is uh, Mrs. Columbo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he comes across as lower class, although he's not because he has a real job and a house and a wife and a college education, but he seems slow, almost to the point of stupidity, garrulous, uh, 
won't shut up, won't go away, keeps showing up the next day with He's questions. not slick or sophisticated. No, very much the opposite. A little short. He has a dog, a big basset named Dog. <laughs> he has a car that no respecting teenager would ever be seen driving. Um, and it doesn't carry a gun. You know, I think I think he on one in one episode he's supposed to uh, qualify at the range. And I think he asked somebody else to do it for him or something. Because it <laughs> does not do those things. Um, anyway, this is sort of a Socrates sort of character. He shows up, and he's usually working with the rich, the powerful, the famous, the beautiful people. One of whom has committed a murder. And um, one thing that was unusual about uh, the Columbus series, originally it w appeared as uh, a rotating mystery movie on, I think, Wednesday nights. Might have been Sunday. Um, they showed you the criminal commit the crime up front. Mm -hmm. So this was not a who done it. You're, you're showed right up front who did it and how they did it. And it's always slick and intelligent. Um, and the question then becomes, well, how is Columbo going to figure out this guy did it? And then how's he going to prove it so that it sticks in court? And it, and from there on, Columbo does very much the kind of thing that Socrates will do. We'll see. Begins asking questions. Some of them are irrelevant. Some of them are annoying. Some of them are pointless. Stories about his wife and his wife's uncle's nephew and, you know, things like that. But eventually, and it throws the bright and beautiful people completely off guard. They're ready to, to answer all questions and, and talk him and take him into their confidence, even to help solve the murder <laughs> until they begin to real, realize he's getting awfully close. And in the end, we realize, wait, he's known what he's doing the whole time. And as we come to Socrates, we're going to see that. We're going to see a character very much like Columbo. Um, but I think as we, uh, if anybody listening wants to get ready for next week, read Plato's Apology. Mm -hmm. It's the one thing we have that probably um, is the best representation representation of how he actually uh, spoke and thought. He didn't write it. His mm -hmm. uh, disciple Plato wrote it. But it was early in Plato's career before he just started putting Socrates in every single story he told. Yeah. <laughs> Socrates was a character that Plato made up. <laughs> to yeah. Some significant extent. Yeah. It, uh, it's hard to prove just how much or how mm, little. But if, if there's any truth in anything he wrote, it will be in the Apology. You can find yeah. out. Soc Socrates is eventually brought to trial for two crimes, corrupting the youth <laughs> and teaching gods unsanctioned by the state. And he defends himself. So if you want to find out who the Socrates person is, read uh, Plato's uh, Socrates Apology by Plato. You can find it online. Yeah. He's yeah. not apologizing. He's no, defending himself. he's defending. It's the old <laughs> sense of apology, defending himself in court. Um, and and I, I ask you to do this, and I challenge you to listen to what Socrates actually says. Uh, the, the verdict of the historians and of um, Enlightenment thought has been, this is a philosopher who was persecuted and prosecuted just for having serious critical opinions of a society that needed help. Poor man, he suffered, just like Jesus. Um, yeah, you should read it for yourself and see what Socrates actually is, because Socrates is slippery. Mm -hmm. He is cagey. There are things he does not address and that he slips around really fast, and you're left with this folksy Columbo-like character, and yet something else is going on here. So um, there we go. The other thing we leave we, you with is um, this concept of universals and particulars that we see in Heraclitus and, and Parmenides. Uh, this is, in many ways, the basic philosophical conflict that runs through the ages. In all of the, uh, the dialectics that we see, you mentioned chaos and order. Uh, Aristotle's going to describe the Greek dialectic as form and matter, with Aquinas its nature and grace, uh, with the Enlightenment its freedom and nature. But the basic conflict is constantly between the universals that pull everything together, truth, meaning, the oneness of things, 
over and against the particulars, the individual things, if the individual things have nothing to pull them together, then they had they don't have meaning. Um, think here, and you mentioned Princess Bride. Move the thing and the <laughs> other thing. If we don't have names for things, if we don't have categories that can pull them together, that's a mass. That's a sale. Well, what makes that a mass? What makes that a sale? Well, definitions and likeness that extends throughout the world. A sail is a sail everywhere. A mast is a mast everywhere. A boat is a boat everywhere. These are now are those where do those universals come from? Are they just things we invented? Are they mere names? Or is there something more? And and philosophy veers back and forth between emphasizing the individuals and their individual significance or autonomy. But as we do so, we lose their very meaning. Or we try to emphasize the meaning and the unity and we lose the individuality and the freedom and the significance of the individual things. And this is the back and forth. I'm going to have a discussion in a few weeks on this very thing, but I'm laying it out here in advance. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. One in the many, universal particulars, unity and diversity, meaning and truth versus autonomous, atomic facts. How do you blend them together? Or to put it in theological terms, is God one or is God many? <laughs> Trick question. Yeah. But we'll talk more about that. We'll uh, talk more about that later. I think maybe if I can throw out one illustration sure. um, from the last century of politics is the radical individualization, um, both of theology and of politics, where it is your individual choice, your individual definition of yourself, your individual concept of yourself mm -hmm. that is so fundamental. And yet, once you've reached that point, you realize, no, but I need someone else to be like me. I need yeah. this concept. And of course, the LGBTQ plus community notice that they need a community. Yeah. Um, they need <laughs> someone else to recognize their own self-conception. Um, it's it's all over this. It's uh, it's about identity, your individual self defined identity, but it needs a name that connects to something else. <laughs> yes, we want names. We want labels. We want to be recognized. We want, we want a group identity. We want to be represented by a group. Yes, yes. Mm. Um, going back a century earlier, it is impossible to understand the Civil War in the United States, or the war between the states of the War of Southern Succession, and Russia, <laughs> Second American War for Independence, whatever you want to call it, without wrestling with this concept of the one and the many. Was the mm -hmm. union a union? Was it one nation or was it many states who could come and go as they like? Or was there something else? And that takes us back to the Constitution. What did the Constitution create? And here we can talk about the Federalist Papers. Mm -hmm. was, it, is the United, was the United States intended to be a nation as we take that today, or was it a federation, a league of states, or was it something else? The Federalist Papers go a long way to argue this is a new animal, and whether mm -hmm. we got it right or not, we were trying for something different. Um, and to the degree that you differ from it, you're going to have problems, which the history of the next few decades bore out leading up to the Civil War. And after, you know, it used to be these United States. Mm -hmm recognizing the true diversity and plurality, now it's the United States. Um, something changed. And to under you need to understand the place that transcendentalism and Unitarianism mm -hmm. play theologically and philosophically in the coming of the war to make sense of this. And again, we, we, you know, we're talking what seems to be ridiculous abstractions by silly people who have nothing better than, to do than to make up word games. And yet well, these people yeah. have changed the world in good degree. A lot of people died. And a lot of people die. They continue to. Um, yeah, my wife is uh, currently working on a project for a friend of ours. Uh, she's looking at the letters and diaries of Sophie Scholz, who was a leader in the White Rose organization in Nazi Germany, opposing Nazi tyranny. She's a young teenager. And uh, what my wife has seen is not that she had, Sophie had a vast theological grasp of the issues, but she was influenced by German Romanticism, which has its roots in Hegel and the philosophers who came afterwards, with an emphasis upon 
experiencing nature and the beauty there. And a lot of what Sophie writes is, you know, went out for a walk, isn't the world beautiful? The uh, the ironic thing is that Nazism, I, I, Kate mentioned Nazism, I said, yeah, Romanticism with a machine gun. Mm-hmm. Um, because they were both disciples of Hegel, but in different directions. One took it in the individual, isn't the world beautiful? Isn't nature important? Nature, God manifests himself in nature. The other says he manifests himself in the state, which is the pinnacle of nature, and therefore you must submit, you must obey. Um, and and so again, it's it's easy for people who don't think on these terms to blow it all off. And it's not everyone's job to pursue this stuff. Mm-hmm. But apparently God has given it to us to talk about it and to see who wants to listen, because some of these uh, these ideas are of vast importance and will continue to be so into the next century. Or more. Yeah. So next time we will pick up with Socrates. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before we go, do we have some recommendations to share? Rachel, you said you had all kinds. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, David and Emily were taking a vacation. I was... I guess, listening to a number of other podcasts and uh, reading some other books and things like that. Um, But I think the first thing that I will recommend for this week um, is a documentary that our friend Wendy uh, gave to me. Um, But I did also find it is available through YouTube and it is called Let My People Go. Mm, I have seen that. Yes, it is um, primarily created hosted by a man named David Clements, who has done a lot of work uh, since the 2020 election, trying to uncover the frauds and things like that in our election system. Uh, But the movie is also focusing on the um, imprisonment of a lot of people based upon the January 6th incident. Um, And so there's an interesting combo there. But the reason I most recommend the movie is because his solution is to say, I am a Christian and the Bible tells me that we all need to look around and we all need to repent of the sins of our nation and we need to beg God to heal our land because... That's why we're suffering all these things. And so I really appreciate his uh, conclusion and Mm -hmm. uh, answer to all the problems that he sees. So that's my recommendation. Cool. Greg? No, you're next. Oh, I have to be next. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I recommend taking a vacation to Switzerland. Okay. Um, Yeah. Like I said, we've been planning this trip for about seven years. Um, And... I've I've ne- this was my first time being off the continent. Oh um, really? I didn't yes. know you'd never gone before. I had never gone and I knew what I did not want to do was do an educational whirlwind tour <laughs> where you see everything and remember nothing. <laughs> um I said I want to go and enjoy being in a nice place. <laughs> that is my <laughs> idea of a vacation. Um so we we rented two different houses. Um, one was in a more touristy area and another was in a less touristy, but still very pleasant area. Um, 